worship be.
We'll be going. We'll be going. 
to thank our very talented musicians for blessing us with the beautiful crazy music. Hello and good morning, family and friends. If I could please have your attention. We're about ready to begin the celebration of life services for this morning. I'd like to invite all of our friends and relatives in our dining and the night area. We'd like to invite you to please come into the chapel and be seated and join us. Our celebration of life services will begin very shortly. And I kindly ask everyone if we can rise so we can open with the word of God, please. Thank you. Let us pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, knows we thank you for the breath of life that you have given us today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. And thank you for the help that you've given to each and every one of us in their own special way. Father God, we just thank you so much for everyone that's here. Thank you for the revival ministry, the gospel heritage, the little Solia sisters in coming and singing on behalf of the celebration of mom's service. Thank you for all our friends and our family that are here. Bless each and every one of them in a special way. Thank you, Heavenly Father, and thank you, Jesus Christ, and thank you, Holy Spirit, for making it possible for all of us to be here. In Jesus' wonderful and powerful name, and we all say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Colossians 3, verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. God has given us life and all the rich blessings that make it enjoyable. And in return, he has claims upon us for service. <coughs> for gratitude, for love, for obedience to his law. He requires us to control passion, to restrain selfish thoughts and actions, and to leave fretful words unspoken. Would Jesus require this self-control if it were not for our real happiness to practice it? No. He wishes us to cultivate such traits of character as will bring peace to our own hearts and enable us to brighten other hearts and lives with the sunshine of love, joy, and cheerful satisfaction. In doing this, we are working for Jesus. He considers all these caretaking, thoughtful deeds as done to himself. This is the most important kind of missionary work, and those who are faithful in these little everyday duties are gaining a valuable experience by employing our time in some useful work. We will be closing a door against Satan's temptation. And would you guys think here, each and every one of you, you have brightened our hearts and lives with the sunshine of love, joy, and cheer cheerful satisfaction. Thank you so much for Titan and Lama. Thank you, 
Thank you, each and every one of you. May God richly bless each and every one of you for being here in celebrating our mom's life. Let me tell you a story. My niece had shared this story with me that when she was working at Walmart, there was this man that would come into Walmart every single day. And his name was Peter. He's not a worker for a Walmart, but every single day, even holidays, he would come in, he would clean the store like he works there, and to each and every worker there, he would encourage them and say, my niece's name is Christy. So she would say, Christy, you're so awesome. She, he would do that to every employee that is in the store. And people that come and shop there thought that he works there every day. And one day he was missing. And they were all worried that they thought something bad had happened to him. But then he showed up. I shared this story because you guys are so awesome for coming here. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here to celebrate with us mom's life. And for that, I thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And may God richly bless you. At this time, our special music from the Revival Ministry. <coughs>
into it. Um, I know my brother has told me that I only have a few minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, so <laughs> I was already, I had my PowerPoint presentation, but to kind of first my bubble saying that they don't have a screen for me, or they don't have a projection. So let me see if I can do this in a lot of time, but if not, please bear with me, because there's a two-part to this eulogy. All right, so my name is Fa'el Fa'lupolu Malamo. Um, my family called me for yeah, air since I'm in the mainland. The Balangis call me Tiny because they cannot pronounce my name. <laughs> right? um, you know, I love my mom because she always called me her number one son. Although <laughs> <laughs> mother is first born by birth, he is not the number one son. <laughs> That honor is bestowed upon me, and you will find out why I am given that by my mom. Okay, um, her family and her close friends lovingly referred to her as Loi, but most people just call her Mata. Originally born and raised in Western Samoa, July 18, 1950, she met and married Simono Malamo Sulu and gave birth to her first four children in American Samoa, Simono Jr. Myself, Mahabi, and Kawai. A short time later, she moved our family to Hawaii, where our youngest three siblings were born, Tai, Taku, and Edward. One of my fondest memories that I have a lot, uh, so one of my fondest memories from childhood memories were of growing up in camper housing for most of, um, most of my life, um, and some of us still live there today. It's so many of <laughs> uh, we remember how mom did everything she could do uh, to be sure we were always fed and had the things that we needed. We might not have had the nicest things, but, we, but she made sure that we got things that we really needed that was important to us. Some people may think that growing up in public housing was really difficult. It, it, it surely was. But we have some incredible ch um, childhood memories, and one of them was, I remember, always on the third of the month. So I know you're too young to uh, remember this or know this, but every third of the month is pain day, right? <laughs> at the housing, right? The adults always send their children to wait at the mailbox, and we always wait for that nice golden envelope, right? <laughs> that envelope, <laughs> right? <laughs> And that envelope is something that the government always sends us. And, and you know, the millman would always hate us being there because everyone was crowding around, making his job a lot difficult. But every time, you know, we always see that thing slide into your box. It's like, wow, oh, hallelujah. We are going to eat tonight. We're going to eat like kings. 
steak, you know, um, shrimp, anything that we can afford. Um, my favorite was my mom always bought us poke, you know, poke, some some oil food. I love that, you know. So I always look forward to the the third of the month. Uh, my next memory of my mom was like whoever's birthday it was on that month, no matter what day it was. You all, your birthday was always celebrated on the third because that's the time you had money. Right? Same you were born on the twenty-eighth. Your birthday is on the third. So my mom made sure, and you always would get for us was always um, brand new underwear. My sister, she always get the, the female stuff. So that's what my mom would give us, right? Perhaps the best memory of all was my mom's cooking. My mom was a great person. She could clean. She was a very tidy, clean person, but her cooking was, um, she needed a lot, a lot of help. A lot of help. Uh, one of her favorite things that she loved to cook, because we always had a lot of it inside the ice box, was the chicken. And, uh, how many ways can you make chicken? You can boil chicken, you can fry chicken, you can bake chicken. Um, and one of the things that I didn't like of her chicken was she tried to make uh, she tried to be fancy and make curry chicken. Yeah, that didn't work out. It was just a powder. <laughs> boil a, uh, boil water with chicken and powder, powder. <laughs> she called that curry. Oh my god. Yeah, that was, that was kind of hard to swallow. Uh, but the greatest accomplishment that my mom was very proud of was that she <coughs> see all of us graduate. All uh, seven yeah. of her children graduate from high school. And that's, she always would preach that on a daily basis. Make sure you graduate, make sure you graduate. Like, we were so tired of her telling us, make sure you graduate. I think we just graduated, just so we can tell her to just not for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we graduated, leave us alone. All right? Um, I mean, all that aside, I mean, Everything that my mom did for us, I know she did out of love. Uh, and she, and she wore two hats. You know? She was not only our mother, but she was our father. Um, and the bigger that we got, you know, uh, then she depended on our uncles to give us the discipline that we needed. And, you know, bless our uncles that are not here that they did. They, they, really, um, they really put a whooping to us. You know, back then, they don't call it abuse, right? They call it misery. I'm going to read you because I love you. Nowadays, they don't know. They call it child abuse. But I was lucky to grow up there because of all, all of the ass whooping I got. I really molded the person I am to, uh, to who I am today, and I thank them for that. Uh, so we are all educated, some of us more than others. In fact, let me tell you a little story about her, her college educated children, right? So by a show of hand, guys, how much of you guys graduated or went to college? <laughs> the operative word, graduated. Right. Raise your hand. That's right, that's right. Okay. So let me see, I was the first in my family to graduate college. Yeah, the first in my family to get married. One more minute. The first of my family. <laughs> I can tell you some, some jealousy in this family. <laughs> first of my family to uh, to give my mom the first grand, uh, granddaughter and her grandson. So that's the whole reason why my mom calls me her number one son. <laughs> I am number one. You know, as much as these guys like the one I admit it, I know they know that it's the truth and the truth hurts. <laughs> Especially for this one, this one right here in front of me. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not a post-school person, I'm just a humble person. <laughs> I'm very humble. I just like to speak the facts. So, I can truly say that I'm so grateful to my mom for all the sacrifices she made raising all seven of us, seven of us as a single mom. Growing up, I didn't remember my mom saying I love you um, very much, but she showed up. She showed us her love in other ways, in many different ways, through her actions and her sacrifices for us. 
If I had to pick one word to describe my mom, it would be resourceful. And my mom was a very resourceful woman. Um, she would always make sure that we had food, especially at the end of the month. She knew what the word of sacrifice was. Uh, and that's the thing that I think for my mom is I try to be as resourceful as I can for my family and to provide for them. You know, um, again, I would love to thank my siblings for allowing me this time. Um, I told them that they're going to regret it <laughs> and that it's not going to be a eulogy that they normally know or have heard of. So that was the first part. <laughs> the second part of my eulogy is uh, audience participation. Uh, with uh, clean, and you turn around. So all you have to do, I'm going to just ask two questions, and I have two prizes that you can pick up from the front. So if you get the question right, then you will pick uh, who she wants to. So the first question is, what is the name of my mom's son, number one son? <laughs> Come on, Amy. Come on, look at your program. In chronological order. And hint, it's not the first one. Really? I said a good speech, and you guys forget who's going to come Who said it? I heard it on this corner. Hey, you still know what to do. Oh, there you go. That, that young man in the back, he has a prize. There's one more. One more. Give me two examples of why I am number one. <laughs> Please, don't everybody jump up. I'm running out of time. If you guys not going to answer, I'm going to stay up here. Chelsea and Cross. Yes, there's one. What else? College. 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 There you go. There you go. Thank you guys for participating. In I appreciate it. Like I said, I'm a very humble person. Um, and at this time, I would like to uh, call out my younger brother, Edward. Um, he has something to a uh, presentation that he wants to do. Uh, again, thank you guys. Have a good day. Uh,
Thank you for taking me to the doctor. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for taking me to Fiat <laughs> Thank you for celebrating my birthday on the third. <laughs> My mom enough. But the comforting thing I have in my heart is I know she gonna wake up. Everything brand new. Her body gonna be brand new. Hallelujah. With that thought, I'll try to get through this song.
At this time, we'll call up the uh, grandchildren for this spaceship visit.
you guys for hearing for the uh, special reason. Um, at this time, I would want to introduce the, uh, the official number one son, <laughs> Simono Halamo Jr. You'll be giving the words of encouragement. <laughs> When I came this morning, I thought I was the number one son. <laughs> Apparently, there's some some other number one son. So uh, my brother said he's the number one son because my mom told him so. But let me tell you why I'm the number one son. <laughs> my brother said by birthright that is true. But more importantly. Because God said so. <laughs> and because I'm the firstborn and God said so, I have the firstborn blessing. <laughs> and if God says I'm number one, then who can argue? <laughs> so with that being said, little brother. <laughs> Let us begin. You know, my mom had many sayings that she would tell us growing up. If my mom didn't agree to something that was happening, she would say, no way, Jose. <laughs> if she didn't like something that was against her beliefs, she would say, pathetic. <laughs> but if my mom had something very important to say, she would tell us, you listen, and you listen good. And then my mom would either pronounce a curse on you, or the blessing. And so this morning, the title for my message is, you listen, and you listen good. It is my hope and prayer that you would listen with a mindset that doesn't say, no way, Jose, nor pathetic, but with a mindset that would listen and listen good because I believe that I have something very important to say. John chapter 3, verse 16 is the most famous Bible scripture in the entire Bible. But in order to understand John 3, 16, you need to understand history. You have to understand our history, mankind's history. The Bible is God's chosen method in recording humanity's history throughout the ages, even to the end of time. The Bible records while our world is full of pain and suffering, death and disease, it is comprised of men and women who were educated and non-educated who graduated from the universities and who didn't quite make it, who were rich and poor, faithful and unfaithful. It is a sacred book that is authored by God himself. It is comprised of men and women in different walks of life whom God had inspired to record his story because history is God's story and it is our story. So in order to truly understand and appreciate John 3, 16 and 17, you have to understand history, Earth's history, mankind's history. So I'm going to attempt to describe our history. And some of you might know it, some of you might not. So here we go. In the first book of the Bible called Genesis, it says that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now in heaven, God created angels to inhabit his kingdom. And the angels were his people, and God was their king. God placed two angels in charge of his kingdom. How many angels? Two. One of the angels' name was Lucifer. And you can read about Lucifer in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12, onward down. Now it says that Lucifer was described, Lucifer is created perfectly. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was covered in sardis, topaz, diamond, brilliant ox, even jasphire, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and even gold. I mean, if you were to see this brother out in the daylight, you would think that he was God. He was appointed by God to be the anointed cherub. Now in the Bible, the word cherub just simply means angel. He was the anointed cherub, meaning that he was the anointed angel. He was one of the highest ranking angels next to God. When God created the angels, he gave them the gift of choice. 
You see, when the angels was created, he was, they were given the ability to choose. Either they could obey God or disobey God. They were given the freedom to follow God or to rebel against him. In every kingdom, there are laws to protect the kingdom and its people. Even in the United States, same thing applies. When God created his kingdom called heaven, he created laws to protect his kingdom and his people. One day, Lucifer decides that he was going to break God's law. He was going to disobey God and rebel against God himself. He was going to sin against God. God. Now the Bible describes sin according to 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. The Bible describes sin as the transgression against the law. It means disobeying God or breaking the law or rebelling against God. So when Lucifer sinned against God, he declared war against his creator. The reason why Lucifer decided to war against God is found in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 onward down. And it reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou got down to the ground which this wickens the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Lucifer wanted to be like the most high. In other words, he wanted to be like God. It wasn't enough that he had superior intellect. It wasn't enough that he was blessed with beauty. He wasn't content with being one of the highest ranking angels in the kingdom of heaven. Lucifer wanted more. He saw how the angels loved God. He saw how the angels praised him. He saw how the angels worshipped him. And this is what he wanted and he was jealous of it. And so Lucifer decides that he would secretly persuade all the other angels to love him, to praise him, to worship him instead of God. But in order to influence the angels of heaven to follow him, he would have to paint God in a negative light. Because up to this point, all they knew about God was God is love. That's all they knew about God. He was the provider and the life giver. That's all they knew. So he had to paint God in a negative light. He needed to convince the angel that God was unjust, unfair, and unfit to be king. And the only way that Lucifer could convince the other angels to follow him was by using two things. Lies and deception. What are the two things? Lies and deception. Now that we're Excuse me. Now there were two angels that God placed in charge of his kingdom. One of them was Lucifer, and the other one, his name was Michael, the archangel. Now the word archangel means chief of the angels. So between Michael and Lucifer, Michael was higher in rank. So God said Michael, the archangel, to convince Lucifer to stop his lies and deception and Lucifer almost decided to return to God to ask him for forgiveness but when Lucifer saw how much the other angels were deceived by his lies when he saw how the other angels worshiped him and how they blindly supported his rebellion he decided that he would rather fight God instead of accepting mercy and forgiveness that was extended to him. You see, that's the thing about God. Before he carries out the punishment, he extends mercy. And so began the war of words and the war that split the kingdom of heaven in two. You can read it in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 onward down. And it reads, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was the place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
Now Lucifer's name begins to change. You see, the name Lucifer means son of the morning. But now because he fought against God, he rebelled against God, he was breaking the laws of God, his name changed from the dragon, a.k.a. the serpent, also known as Satan or the devil. Those are the names that he uses. As time went on, God decides to create mankind and their beautiful home called Earth. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning, God created two things, the heaven and the earth. So here's where we come in. Here's our history. If you read in Genesis chapter 1, day 1, God creates light and darkness. He calls light day and darkness night. Day two, God creates the firmament, which he calls heaven, the atmosphere. Day three, God gathers the dry land and calls it earth, and he calls the waters, and he gathers the waters together and calls it seas, and he makes the trees and the vegetation. Day three. Day four, God creates the sun and the moon and the stars. Day five, he creates the sea creatures and the birds. Day six, he creates the land animals. And the crowning act of God's creation, he creates you and I, or mankind. Amen. Day seven, God didn't create nothing. In fact, he instituted a day of worship. On the seventh day, God instituted a day called the Sabbath day. And on this day, God expected mankind to rest because in doing so, God would bless them. God would sanctify them. They would be his people, and he would be their God. The seventh day. Amen. Not the first nor the third. The seventh day. The Sabbath day. When God created mankind. He gave them everything they needed to survive. As long as mankind obeyed God's instructions, they were happy. As long as they followed their commands, his commands, they were peaceful. As long as they listened to his laws, they were protected. When God created mankind, just as he created the angels, he gave them the gift of choice. You see, just as the angels could choose to follow God and choose to disobey God, human beings had the same gift. God didn't want to force mankind to love him because they were afraid of him, but rather God wanted mankind to obey him and worship him from the heart. It's kind of like a relationship. You don't want someone to like you because they're forced to like you. You want them to like you because they love you. It's the same thing with God. He wanted his creation to love him because they loved him. Not because they were afraid of him. Besides providing mankind with everything they needed to survive, God gave them a divine institution called marriage. And it was between a man and a woman. And that's another sermon for another time. <laughs> he gave them a garden home called Eden and a day of worship called the Sabbath. God wanted mankind to have eternal life. But in order for mankind to have eternal life, he must first pass the test. Are you listening? And are you listening good to our history? Before God gives mankind eternal life, he must first make sure that mankind is trustworthy enough, he is obedient enough, he is loyal enough, he is loving enough to receive eternal life. So here is the test. In the middle of the garden home, God puts two trees. One of the trees is called the tree of life. The other tree is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God instructs King Adam because he was the first king. God instructs King Adam that you could eat of every tree in the garden except for one. And that was from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God continues to tell Adam that if you eat from the forbidden tree, 
you will die. Here is where death is first mentioned in the Bible. In fact, the Bible's definition of death is described in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. The word wages means penalty. Or it is the consequences, or it is the results. The consequences of sinning is death. The results of sinning is death. That's what Romans 6, 23 says. We pick up the story in Genesis chapter 3. Here we see Queen Eve. The first woman that God creates. And she is walking in the Garden of Eden, admiring the beauty of God. <clears throat> and what amazed her was she came across the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she saw a snake. Now, nothing spectacular about the snake. But when the snake began to talk, it caught her attention. And the snake says, did God really say what he said about death? You see, that's how Lucifer works. He begins to question. He makes you question the word of God. Did God really say that, Eve, that you couldn't eat from the tree, that you're going to really die? Read it. Genesis chapter 3. The devil comes to Eve in the form of a snake to deceive her about God. He was hoping that he could deceive Eve so that she could eat from the forbidden tree so that mankind would sin against God and the results would be death. Death would fill the earth if they were to eat of the forbidden tree. Funerals and cemeteries would be everywhere if mankind would eat from the forbidden fruit. Read the story in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. I kid you not, it is recorded in God's history. Genesis chapter 3, here we see mankind records of how death entered into our world. It was because of the devil's deception and lies. And he was able to convince King Adam and Queen Eve to sin against their God. You see, friends, humanity is the descendants of Adam and Eve. Humanity was created from God himself. Now there's a popular belief that says that man came from monkeys, and maybe so. But according to the Bible, man came from the hand of God himself. <laughs> but here's the thing, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, when they ate from the forbidden fruit, before God carried out the death sentence, he extended his mercy. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. It talks about a promised seed that God will send on mankind's behalf. And this promised seed, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, and 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, is none other than Jesus Christ. The promised seed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. That whosoever believeth in his story, history, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 is just as powerful. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Friends, this is the blessed hope that my mom died with. And this is the blessed hope that makes death bearable. Because without this hope called Jesus, it would break humanity. It would crush humanity. And it would destroy his spirit. To live a life of guilt and pain and suffering like no one else can imagine. But here's the good news. That whosoever believeth in Jesus shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's our history. That's the record. And that's God's promise. And that's the hope that my mom died with. And not only my mom. Countless others. 
family members, friends, aunties, uncles, whom placed their same hope in the blessed hope. You see, the hope for a dying world is none other than Jesus Christ. And if we were to give God an honest chance to help us when we need help, to lead us when we have no sense of direction, God will help us. <sighs> I grew up in a dysfunctional home, as you can imagine. We had several number ones. I mean, that was mind-boggling in itself. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was a, was a drunk, but he was a hard worker. He was a good provider. And I, I got that from my dad. My mom said, son, you, you're a good provider, just like your father. Thanks, mom. My dad was a drunk, very abusive. I remember him coming home at nights, drunk Friday nights with his martini glass, with his toothpick and olive. Drinks the lash, eats his olive, flick his toothpick, and crack his glass, and walk in the house. Every Friday, no miss. And we come home and argue with my mom. And at the end of the argument, he would beat my mom. And every time, I would try and run out. To try to stop my dad. No, dad. Every time, same thing. Give me a field goal kick and throw me up against the wall. Every time, no miss. I grew up in a dysfunctional home. You know, my dad, I told myself, I made a promise to myself that I will never be like my dad. But you know what? <laughs> I ended up being like my dad. <laughs> my mom always preached, graduate, graduate, graduate. And we did graduate, and guess what? After I graduated, I really graduated. I graduated and I really went into the school of alcohol and drugs. I graduated from one school and went to the other school. I began to abuse my family, just like my dad. It was so hard that my dad, my, my mom called on my uncles and my aunts to help control me because I was getting out of control. My family tried, but nobody could control me. See, I didn't know that I needed God's help at the time because my mentality was, nobody can stop me. I'm the toughest SOB on the planet. Not even bullets can stop me. <clears throat> that was my mentality. If you met me back then, I don't think you would have liked me. I told my wife, Han, if you met me back then, oh, I don't think you would have married me. <laughs> and she said, yeah, I probably wouldn't. One day, and I'm trying to close, one day, as we're partying on the side of our house, called the corners, I hear two friends arguing. One of them was six. So I hear them arguing, and they're arguing about God. And my other friend, he's a Catholic. <laughs> and so here they are, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and a Catholic Christian arguing about God. So I took my beer, I sat down, and I listened to the argument, and they made good arguments. And one of the things that they argued about was the mark of the beast, and revelation, and prophecy, and 666, and these are the things that I had questions on a long time ago when I was a young kid. And it intrigued me. Several weeks later, I was invited to church, and so I decided to attend staff invited me and when he invited me I said yes 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 because I just wanted him to leave me alone you know he's a nice guy it's hard to say no to a nice guy so I just said yes 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 and then Seka shows up the next day and he says you're ready to go to church I said what do you mean church yeah Taff said come and pick you up I go when did I say that and you know back in back in the days your word is your bond you had nothing but your word to stand on. And so I had to go. I didn't want to look bad in front of the boys. And it was a fighting fight. So here I was, going to church, 
Zeta's dad, Masima, was waiting for us in the car. <laughs> Past all the fellas, music blaring. Sims, are you like a feel? Oh no, I'm in church. The music stopped. What? <laughs> all eyes on me. All my friends. He's in church. What's going on? You okay? <laughs> yeah, come back, come back. I'll drink later. Save me one. We'll go on. <laughs> Wait, because I, I said yes to tap, and I just want to go to the service and then come home and drink. That was my intention. I went. Pastor, late. Ron Helferson was preaching. My spiritual father. When I walked in Central Church, the first words that I heard was, God loves you, brother. I looked around and said, who are you guys talking to? As I was walking down, he keeps telling, he keeps pointing out like he was pointing to me. God loves you, brother. Yeah, you're talking to me, or You don't know who I am. I sat down, and those words kept ringing. God loves you. And I'm thinking, God cannot love me. The things that I did, no way. So I wanted to prove that God didn't love me. So the pastor said, take down all the texts, write it down. Go home and study it because God loves you. I said, oh yeah? I went, okay, I'm going to write it down. I'll go prove to you that God doesn't love me. So I wrote down all his Bible texts. But the next day, went home, I drank. The next day, I got up, hang over. What is his nephew? Oh yeah, God loves me. I want to prove that God doesn't love me. Ma, the own Bible. Yeah. English Bible. Yeah. <laughs> I start looking at the text. At the end of the searching, it was I couldn't believe that God could love such a person like me. That was the start of my journey. And so the next day, I call up and say, So it says, What? You guys get church again? Oh, yeah, so they what? You live down. What? You pick me up. Shucks. I go the second day, the third, the fourth. The last day, he makes an altar call for, for, for baptism. And this is my thought process. God, okay, I'm beginning to see that you love me. Ooh. Oh, man, if the boys find out that I, 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 I'm giving my life to you, ooh, I'm going to be the laughing stock of Camp Hope. I mean, I'm a tough guy, God. And mind you, before the pastor came to preach, this is his prayer, the pastor that baptized me. This is his prayer. Father, send me the toughest, roughest person in this city to be used for your glory. That's his prayer everywhere he goes. And I didn't know that. Well, at that time, guess who was the roughest, toughest, meanest SOB? That was my mentality. Nothing could stop me, not even bullets. And there I was. Baptism. God, if I'm going to do this, you got to show me how, because I, I don't know how to give my life to you. I don't know how to stop all these things that I know I'm doing that I'm supposed to be stopping. <laughs> no idea how I'm going to stop my drugs. I love my drugs. I love to smoke. I love to drink. I'm going to have to help me. That night, I stood up, wanting to be baptized. Well, Word got to my mom. Your son is getting baptized at the Asufiku Church. On my baptism day, I stood in line, ready to be baptized. I didn't care what my friends would say. I was concerned about my family, what, what they would say. But man, I decided to give God an honest chance. Like how I gave my drugs an honest chance. Right before I got baptized, someone comes in, slips their hand in my hand, 
I look. It was my mom. She says, son, I've been praying for you for seven years. Ooh. Seven years when Simola was a terror of camp what housing. My mom was going to prayer meetings, even Wednesday prayer meetings. You know when they ask, does anybody have a prayer request? Raise your hand. And my mom would always say, please pray for my son, Simolo. He loves to drink and smoke. Every Sunday, every Wednesday. My mom tells me, seven years, but then I, I didn't even know that. It was because of my mom's prayer that God protected me. I could have been dead. God protected me. Parents, friends, you have a loved one that's out there in the world doing no good stuff. The best thing that you can do for them is prayer. That's the best thing. And allow God to be God. I got baptized. You know when I got baptized? God told me two things that you have, Mona. Two gifts that I'm going to give you. And I'm not telling you that. Uh, I'm not telling you this as, 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 a, as a lie. <laughs> I'm telling you this as God told you. <coughs> two gifts I'm going to give you, Mona. One is teachings, and the other is preaching. Before I got baptized, I knew my gifts. I haven't preached a sermon in a while. In fact, a couple years, I haven't preached a sermon. You know, God could have taken my gift and given it to someone who's more faithful than I am. But He still allows me to do that because He loves me. Friends, Give God an honest chance to work in your lives. When you're ready, God is ready. When you want to, He is more than willing. And I just want to thank you all for coming and paying respect to my poor mom. May God bless you.
Lord, for these beautiful souls that have come here today to celebrate mom's life. In their physical, in their financial, in their mental and emotional. Bless them. Guide us in our service and thank you for your love and your kindness. And we ask that you will bless the food that we're about to eat. May it be healthy and nourishing. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. Amen.
I was hurting all alone. I was searching for a comfort I could find on my own with no direction. Feeling down, my life was headed for disaster. Do you turn me around? Nothing ever had been able to ease me when trying to please me. It only pleased me less. But when I learned about the way that you love me. Had to put your honor above me, and you gave me rest. Lead me to rest, sweet Lord. Lead me to rest oh, from my journey here. Lead me to rest. The relief I found from the burdens that have weighed me down. What a comfort! What a deal! As I consider what you offered me, how can it be real? What should I offer in return? When the value of your blessings no one could ever ever. Forgiven, got a reason for living, and you made it so clear. Yeah, I'm supported when the devil would charm me, protected when the evil would harm me. Tell me how can I feel? Lead me to rest, sweet Lord. Lead me to rest. From my journey here, lead me to rest. The relief I found from the burdens that have weighed me down. Lead me to rest. Lead me to rest. Lead me to rest. In the world, my life was slowly sinking, suffocating to peace at all. Never listening. To what you had to say, not a word you had to say. Now it's fortunate you've changed my thinking after answering your oh, loving call. You give me rest that nobody can take away. Can take it away. Lead me to rest, sweet Lord. Lead me to rest. Oh, I'd like to thank everyone coming out for Mom's uh, burial service. This is the first the first burial service that I've ever had. shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. 
For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall we walk the past, the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? We look forward to the day that these mortal bodies will become immortal and death will be no more as the Bible describes. We shall be changed at the second coming of Christ. So in our time of loss, in our time of hurt and mourning, let us not forget the words of encouragement spoken by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 onward down and it says, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are dead, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which die in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I'm grateful that the God of heaven understands how to comfort us when we experience a death in the family because he too had experienced a death in the family. One of my mom's favorite songs was My God Loves Me. And I would like to sing that song as a as a tribute to her. And after that song is sung, and then we can place our flowers or your lays or whatever the case might be, and then they will lower her resting spot. So let us begin. My God loves me and all the wonders I see. The rainbow shines to my window. Now place your flowers. 